So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, there are uh, getting close to 20 of us on live right now. Um, and this presentation will also be recorded and Quasi will make that available for folks to watch asynchronously. Um, so I'm Adam Ward, uh, up, up, over, down at Indiana University, uh, depending on wherever you are. Um, and uh, this is the second in a series of discussions that we have been hosting. Um, we will have uh, some weekly events in the, at this time and space um, for the next three weeks. Uh, next week, we'll have Imad Habib talk to us about HydroLearn uh, and how to get yourself started both making modules and using modules there. Um, after that, we'll host a couple of student panels where uh, gregarious undergraduates and graduates uh, with their grades finalized will uh, tell us the real talk about how the semester went uh, and answer those things that they might not have been willing to share while they were in courses. Um, but this week uh, I'm especially proud to introduce uh, Matt Ross to everybody. Um, so Matt is an assistant professor at Colorado State University. Um, Matt has agreed to talk to us today about some sort of quick and easy things you can do to make asynchronous recordings better. Um, so we're gonna have, Matt has about a 15 minute talk to share. Um, after that, we'll take any question and answer for Matt about his topic. Uh, and by the time we hit the second half hour of this meeting, um, we'd like to open it up to a broader panel discussion about how this transition to online education has gone, what you're struggling with, what tips you might wanna share. Um, Becca Barnes and Ann Jefferson uh, and Skylar Herzog are joining me as panelists to help try to answer questions. Um, but if you use the raise hand tool in Zoom, um, Julia Ma uh, Masterman from Quasi will unmute you and uh, you all can participate in the conversation as well. So uh, with that, Matt will give us a presentation. We'll follow that with Q&A for him and then some community discussion to uh, see what we can learn from each other. All right, Matt, it's all yours. Well, I think I just shared my screen, which shows nothing really. Got it. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, how I've been making videos. And I actually was, I, I taught a uh, flipped class last fall and uh, on like environmental data science. And so here's my like YouTube channel that has all that, those videos. And um, initially I was using a variety of things and I sort of ended up settling on this software called Open Broadcast Studio. And uh, I really like it for a lot of reasons. It's really flexible and really easy to use. Um, and it's uh, open source, so that's really nice. You can use it on Windows, Mac, or Linux platforms. And I'm just gonna like briefly walk through how to make these kinds of videos. I think an initial ad for this said high quality videos. I make no claim that <laughs> this will make high quality videos uh, all of a sudden easy, but it certainly is a, um, uh, it doesn't take a lot of time to get set up. So. Um, you know, first, obviously, the, you, you would install OBS, which is just what it's called. Um, it's already installed on my computer. And um, when you open it, you have no, there's nothing that's recording yet. So it's just black. Um, so then you go into this little like box on the bottom and I can make it bigger that says sources. And you can click just plus um, and maybe we wanna capture my uh, video screen and I'm at home and so my laptop has a, a um, camera, but I also took my work camera in. So I'm gonna switch it over to this screen. So now um, that should be, oh, it can't because I'm using it for Zoom. Okay, never mind. We can only use this one because the Zoom one is being used. So anyways, you can switch your camera. Um, you can change the resolution. Um, I, if you're like live streaming or something, you might wanna decrease the resolution. So this has a pretty high native resolution, but we can decrease it. Um, and then you might want to shrink your video and you can move it around. So let's put it down here. And so now my video is ready. Um, and luckily the microphone was already added. Uh, sometimes this won't be true and you can just add like an audio input capture. The other thing that's nice about this as compared to some of the other um, meeting softwares is you can actually add audio output capture. So if you're doing something where you want to capture another video that someone put, say I have a clip of a video that Becca made. Uh, I can actually just capture her audio directly rather than having it go out of my speaker and into the mic and get all distorted and ugly. Um, so that's another thing that you can add. Uh, I won't do that here. And then the other thing that you probably wanna add is a display capture. So we'll go ahead and uh, create a new display capture. 
and uh, I see a lot of like chat things. Oh well, if they're important, someone unmute themselves and interrupt me. Um, so I'm going to switch the oh, display Matt. to not. I, yeah, go ahead, Adam. I, so I, I will interrupt you. Um, so you're showing us the uh, this open broadcast studio, uh, open broadcaster software. Excuse me. Yep. Um, and you mentioned that you tried a bunch of different things and ended up here. And so Aditi asks um, if you could tell us a little bit about why this was better than other ones that you used. Why did yeah. you settle on this platform? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't even remember what I tried. I think I read one of those articles that's like uh, how to record local videos. And I tried the first three or four. And most of them um, ended up having a pay tier to do all the full advanced stuff. Whereas Open Broadcast Studio, you can do everything in here. Um, with without paying so it's completely free um, and then you can also sort of um, if you choose to because you really like it and i have chosen to do this you can actually donate to the to the sort of effort and so i really like the idea of this open source um, effort that democratizes access to these high quality production tools um, and i actually just found it really easy to use is why i settled on it i found the other ones um, either too much or too little so i found this had a little a, a nice um, sort of balance between just the right amount of information. Um, so that's ended up being how I chose it. I think I can actually see the Q&A if I try. Okay, yeah, I did ask that's the best option. Um, and so that that was sort of my thing. And then I also at the time was not live streaming. I actually think Zoom has a pretty good, you have a lot of capacity within Zoom to do a pretty good recording, um, but these were pre-recorded. So I w there was no need to Zoom them. Um, so that was sort of the, ended up being the goal. Um, okay, I think, I'll keep checking the Q&A occasionally now that I know how to see it. Um, but so uh, when Adam jumped in, I was just adding this thing that was a display capture. And you know, I had two displays and so I just, you can move them around. Uh, obviously this one gives you this nice mirror effect where you see the infinity of your screen, but we don't want that. So I just switched it to the display two and then it tells you the resolution you're displaying at. And it asks if you want it to see the cursor, which most of the time for the videos we're making, you probably do. Um, so, you know, now I have this video, but now my video capture device went away. Okay, well, I just go up and I right click on it and I say, um, I check the order and I say move up. And then now my video will pop up uh, in the bottom right. Um, and then uh, that's sort of the main, you know, you can move this around, you can make it bigger, you can do, you can change the options like live uh, as you, are recording. So sometimes with my um, recordings in class, you know, I'll be coding for a while and explaining a thing and then I'll want the students to focus on what I'm saying and I'll just make myself bigger and sort of uh, up the, like make the side, the, um, question, the um, code invisible. And so then this is just like what I would be doing. Um, and so now that I have this set up, the mic is working, everything seems to be working. I can just do start recording. And um, in the bottom right, it'll tell it, you have this little red dot that says it's recording. Um, and then this is occasion. It usually something's weird. I thought weird stuff might happen because I'm recording so many streams right now uh, with Zoom and this. But um, you, there's also usually on the right hand of this stop and start recording is a little pause button. Because if you stop this recording, it's going to save the video. So right now I'm recording. Uh, normally, you know, in, in a class, I would like open our studio. This is like a video, like some stuff I pre-coded. And I'd be like, hey, you know, here's, you got to load the tidyverse package, blah, 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 blah. And then I would run the code and some visualization would come up um, that I would explain to my students. And then, um, you know, this might be a case where the code's running and I sort of want to explain like, hey, so, um, you know, when you're thinking about coronavirus, you really got to think about the quality of the data because we don't know anything about anything because we're not testing enough. Um, and then I would sort of move in and out of my window and let them sort of uh, see me while I'm giving the lecture part. And then when it goes back to having the video finished, um, I would actually like sort of zoom in on that. Um, so, you know, and then the other thing you can do is like, I just finished a thought, but my code is still rendering so I could stop recording. Um, and then I can just show you where that recording goes in my, on my computer, it's just preset to go to the videos folder. And so you can see some of my other, um, what's today, the May 1st. Yeah. So it's May 1st. Um, and so now this video that we just recorded is now here and it's hard to talk because I'm listening to myself talk. Um, 
just kind of that's what the video looks like now and then um you know this video that i just made in our studio is almost ready so i can start recording again uh and you know sometimes that's seamless and sometimes you make mistakes and it's fine um so once this sort of video gets up i would be like hey students you know what do what do we think about this video um and it's gonna render theoretically feel like double pressure. I'm live streaming and recording and recording on my own computer. Um, so this, you know, this is very common in, in my code videos, especially that something is sort of takes longer or take, um, doesn't work quite as well as you want it to. Okay, so now um, it's working. You can see this like visualization of cumulative cases versus daily new cases, which is a reasonable way to think about growth rates of coronavirus. And um, that's just sort of like what my you know, maybe that's what I'm discussing in class. Um, I'm gonna sort of stop that because it takes a lot of energy. So now let's say I'm done, uh, I'm gonna stop recording. And then now if I go um, back to the videos folder, uh, now I have two videos that are recorded today. And so then, you know, that's the sort of OBS part. It's that simple, it's a really, pretty basic and um, that, that, that's where I would sort of end. Um, and then, you know, I would just close OBS, I'm done. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I set this up as a new one, uh, but you can actually save your presets. So like how, how loud your mic is and other things like that, you can move around and then you just go to scene collection and you make a new one. Um, so I have one that's called lectures and it looks like this. Um, so that's just like, you know, you can, you can sort of pre-save stuff. Um, there's a lot you can do with OBS. This is not like really an OBS tutorial. It's more to just say this exists and this is how I use it. Um, I don't, yeah, good question, Comedy. Uh, it's a dot wave. Oh, MKV, yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, so it's a dot MKV um, and then actually, you know, when you're often, if I live stream properly, like I, I, I it's like one recording, a uh, one shot and I do it right. <laughs> I'm really happy because if I have to do the next step, uh, which I'm going to show you now, it, it just adds a lot of time because now you're going to have to compile and compress videos. And um, yes, Yinpen, you can uh, pause. I don't know why it's not showing that right now in mine, um, but every other time I've ever used OBS, there's a little pause button to the right. And there's also a hot key. You can learn the hot keys to pause. Like it's like function F9 and it'll pause automatically. Um, and that would help you avoid what I'm doing now, which open shot video editor is a lot like uh, iMovie for um, um, if you have a Mac. And so now I just want to like add in those two videos I just recorded. So I'm going to add them into this little queue up here and then um, just add them into this track list. And, um, you know, now this is like the two videos we just recorded and we'll click play in them. And so now it's playing and I'm, I'm sort of like disappointed that I ran this code and then I have a bunch of dead space maybe. So then I can sort of zoom in on the time and I can take this little snip tool and I can like snip out that dead space. And then there's some dead space at the beginning of this video too. So we can snip out maybe like another five seconds. And then uh, turn off the snip tool, delete these two clips, grab them, pull them over. Uh, and then now the video, when I press play, it'll be less of a dead space. Obviously I could have cut more in this case. Um, and then when you're done editing this and you can add like, mp4 tracks and other things on top of this to make it you know you could basically do super professional video editing if you so chose uh, but when you're done with something like this in the open shot video editor you can just do export video um, and so you know that'll save it as like an mp4 or something that you then could upload to youtube so this second step is usually if i like coded a 25 30 minute coding lecture and in the last five minutes i made some major errors uh, often that involves me cursing to myself realizing that i cursed to myself and having to go find that and delete it um so that that's sort of like why you might use something like open shot editor um video editor if you have imovie or a mac obviously this works the same um 
So I'm going to um, close this open shot. I'm not going to export it. And then the last thing I'm going to say is that um, the other thing I really like about OBS is everything we just did to, uh, oh, that's over here because I'm reading the wrong screen. Go away. Um, I think I need to reorder this still. Move up. Oh, or maybe, oh, because it's, this is the other camera, whatever. It, this is a Zoom interference issue. But the other thing you can do with OBS is not just record, but I can actually directly live stream. Um, and I think this has some huge advantages. I've seen a lot of these, I've actually been part of a Zoom bomb dissertation defense, and that's really distressing and horrible. And um, I think that, you know, when, when we're as a community moving to online presentations, in particular supporting our students as they present, um, I think that the conference software has this really big problem where basically if you have an open invitation on Twitter or social media, you have to password protect it and pre-register and do all these things to sort of protect the student presenting or the faculty member presenting from uh, the Zoom bombing madness. Um, and I think we can do better because we really want to advertise these as these super simple things that anyone can get to. And to me, the best solution to that is basically doing live streaming and with uh, comments off. And so you could imagine you have a live stream that you really want to advertise and you want to get a big audience. And so you, but you want to minimize the barriers to watching that. So people who watch it on their phones and just sort of immediately participate. And um, OBS, all you would do is you'd set up your whole thing like this and then you'd click start streaming and uh, it's going to ask for a stream key. And then I can't do this because I'm recording with, uh, oh, you're already seeing that. But like on YouTube, you can make these live, live recordings and you just go, you'd go to go live um, and it's gonna sort of load this, this live studio essentially. And um, you create like a, this is a demo and you could schedule it for later. So like if this is a defense, you could schedule it for an hour from now or something. Or if this is like a web conference um, that you really want people to, to see, you could schedule it for later and then you advertise for a couple days ahead of time. And then you just, uh, no, it's not made for kids. You are, are, and then this is gonna make a thumbnail, I guess. Yay. Um, and then you can do, uh, you basically go into the settings and you can actually get like a key um, out of the, these settings. Um, and then what you do is you take this key, which I can't find right now, because uh, it's I think it, I think because I'm already streaming, it changes things. Um, but you can basically grab a key, and then in and then in OBS, um, you you need to uh, let's do that again. Start streaming. Uh, you open the settings for a new key, and then you go to stream, and you would just uh, say that you're doing YouTube, and then you'd enter this uh, streaming key, and then whatever is on your OBS is going to live stream to YouTube. And I think that's kind of a nice way that I haven't seen yet, uh, surprisingly, people to do like a public defense that is um, immune from Zoom bombing and abuse. Um, and then you could obviously have like a discussion place that is at the last 15 minutes, uh, that's a Zoom call or something. Uh, I'm not going to save the changes. And that's really what I wanted to get through. So um, stopped my screen share, and then I'm happy to take questions if they came up. So Matt, I'll just, I'll read you two from uh, the chat box that came to the panel here. Um, so one of the questions is, um, again, could you articulate some of the things that you like about this as opposed to just using Zoom to record? Um, because that's certainly one of the things that many universities early on said hit record to cloud in Zoom and you're good to go. So why yeah. would, why would uh, Sarah O'Keefe use go to this trouble, for example? Yeah, I, um, I don't think you have to do this in any way whatsoever. So if like, I, you know, I was like all of us adjusting my course along the way, trying to figure out like asynchronous is best. And then I was like, wait, my worst students seem to not be watching the videos because you can track that on YouTube and other things. Uh, not worst. My students who are uh, having the biggest troubles with the online transition um, are struggling to follow without the community aspect. And so I actually switched to doing live lectures. And so when I started doing live lectures, I did exactly that. I started recording Google Meet live recordings. It's super fast and then it's saved in the cloud like immediately. Um, and I think that works really well. That said, uh, those videos I have very little post hoc control over. 
and I'm a very controlling person. <laughs> so when I make these videos, I kind of have the, the long-term vision for making videos for me is that I make it once and it's good enough for next year. Obviously that's like very unlikely in the first time you do it. So like my environmental data science class that has a bunch of online videos, every single one of those videos needs improvement. But the idea would be that next year I, I'm dialed in, I know that I'm targeting like 15 minutes and I'm gonna make it really high quality. And there I really like the control I have on the local um, thing. And that is meant to be delivered asynchronously because it's meant to be delivered in a flipped class. Um, so then the question is why, yeah, Adam. Oh, uh, well, I was gonna say one of the things you also noted that I thought was really nice was the, the real ease of editing tools. Um, you know, I watched you in 10 seconds snip out some dead space or you could garble something up and it seems quite easy to snip that out and get rid of it or add, add a pause or combine two recordings when the cat comes and interrupts you yep. or something. Yeah, and that happened all the time previously. So I think this is when you're really trying to make higher, uh, let's say longer lasting videos, maybe not high quality still, cause it's hard to make high quality videos. So maybe for me, that's why I used this um, for those. And then um, I didn't have this opportunity this semester, but certainly going forward, if we're online for much longer, um, some of the things that I work on, I would just like to share with beyond my class. And so then I really like the live streaming aspect uh, because then I can just like blast YouTube, everything, or sorry, Twitter and Kawazi listservs and EOS listservs and all those things. And just be like, click this link, it'll be YouTube live. Comments are disabled so we don't get uh, random noise. And then afterwards, there'll be a smaller Zoom room that you need a password for or whatever. Um, and you have to pre-register and get the password and all that. So I, I sort of like both of those aspects. Um, uh, and that's in, ended up being why I did something slightly more complicated. That said, in my own class, I shifted towards the end, not doing this and just doing live lectures and recording those because I felt like that helped preserve the community aspect of the class a little more. Um, and so, you know, I was switching back and forth and just kind of like surviving. Um, so I think in the future, the goal for using OBS for me is a lot of like higher quality, longer lasting videos um, that are less about building community and a little bit more about content delivery. And then afterwards we can have a discussion that maybe would be live stream recorded in Zoom or Meet or something where I don't care about the polish as much. So Matt, I'm, I wanna interrupt your uh, your presentation, I guess, just for a moment here. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of folks on the line. Uh, you've talked about this balance between asynchronous, where you have more polish, but it may not be getting watched versus live recordings. I guess I'm wondering if folks out there, um, if either of the any of the other panelists who are on had thoughts about how that's gone in their class, or um, if you're on as an, as an attendee, uh, there should be a raise hand tool that you can use and Julia could uh, invite you into the conversation um, and you could share your thoughts as well. Uh, so anyone want to reflect a little bit on synchronous versus asynchronous um, or meaning live versus recorded in this case? Um, so I can I can volunteer my perspective. Um, I made the decision right away to go to asynchronous because I'm parenting and uh, dual faculty, you know, family. And so the idea of having to perform live uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. was not necessarily going to work real well. Um, and I was generally happy with it. I was a little, I, there definitely was a loss of a sense of community and perhaps that impacted some students, but the students seemed very positive. I think I've gotten more thank you for making this a great class, thank you for being so flexible, um, sort of emails from the students this semester than I've ever gotten in the past. And I and maybe all my colleagues are getting those too, but it was it felt like a nice validation of the approach that I took. Um, one of the things, I tried not to obsess about my YouTube views, <laughs> um, uh, but one of the things that I was a little disappointed in is that uh, there were times when I said, well, this is, I'm going to be in online office hours during the class time and I will go over this material then. Um, and it was funny because when I advertised it that way, as opposed to, I will answer any questions you have about the problem set, I got less attendance in my online office hours than when I just left it wide open. So it didn't seem like there was a lot of appetite for an optional 
live class. Maybe if I tried to make those mandatory, I would have gotten more participation, but then I would also have run into issues of students who couldn't participate feeling left out. So the long, the short version of that is I'm generally happy with how it went, but if I were to start a class um, out as online, I would definitely have to have something synchronous to build that community in the first place. I would just say the the my two best um, live classes were we did these like complicated reading exchanges. So there was like smaller groups and then like a larger group. So it's sort of like things pair share in a digital way. And um, I basically said if you don't if you can't come, totally understand. You'll have to write a one page summary of your paper. And so, so I think no one wanted to write a one page summary, which is fair. And so I had nineteen out of twenty three that day. Uh, come and it was like the best so far I did three of those and they were like by far the best class and so I think uh, the community forward version where it was not really about me delivering things it was about them meeting with each other worked far better um, than any any time like I had a career navigation like live lecture hoping that they would do feedback but I had like a lecture and I think like 10 out of 23 came so it was like once you shifted to more like me talking at you they're like I'll just watch it later or not watch it at all um as someone who so I started teaching my class online because Colorado College has this unique system of teaching where we do everything really quickly and intensively so um a block is three and a half weeks uh due to pandemic that got shortened to three weeks um so 15 days for an entire class and um i added more synchronous time throughout and all of my synchronous time was essentially what matt just described um with maybe me talking for five or ten minutes to give an overview of what i had learned from everyone's input the night before uh keep in mind when you do a class every day for uh you do it every day for 15 days right so um i typically have five to six contact hours with my students a day so i moved down to one and a half contact hours of synchronous learning a day um and that and then i also had optional office hours but what i found that was really helpful was constructing ways for them to interact offline that mimicked the community that they would have had if we had all been in you know the classroom together or they had come to my office um, and ask questions and so i often would give this overview and then we would have breakout rooms um, often driven by articles that they read the night before um, similar to what matt talked about there was no threat of a paper though um uh but it was so i was teaching our senior capstone uh, class, right? So this is the last class the seniors need to take to graduate. Um, it's a very different space to be operating in. And I, my number one priority was making sure that they knew that uh, they're awesome and they're seniors and they are applying their knowledge to a problem, even though they're online and not in person. And so uh, I thought that that community building was really critical and they ac actually asked for it. Um, we had 30 students, I would say we I had 28 synchronous with me every day. Um, it's a very different setting to start with. I recognize I'm starting from a different space, but um, we did polls to figure out time zones. We figured out the time zone that would work and the time that would work best for everyone. We required 80% of that synchronous stuff to be attended to. And I would say require is the wrong word, required with air quotes. Um, so. Uh, it was a totally different class, but I do think that that was really critical to the students having community because that was the whole point was for them to work together to solve a problem. So um, I would not take the same approach if I was doing like my intro class where I was teaching them like equations and how to solve problems. So I think that that's also something that's really important and like for me thinking like forward as the fall potentially is online, like how do we really like uh, garner all of our lessons from these different types of classes and how do you like sort of mix them together to make a really good online learning class when hopefully our brains are less pandemic-y and um, more about, you know, working in this space. I don't know if that's actually possible, the less pandemic-y part, but it's hopeful. Um, what I wanted to build on uh, was, was two things about this particular platform. 
Um, I've been recording videos and having students watch them before lecture to do some of the foundational work um, to prime them before they get to class. Uh, one of the things I really like that Matt is doing is he's got himself visible. Um, so as opposed to a narrated PowerPoint, for example, um, or, or just an ominous voice when only the screen is visible. Uh, I've done both and my students consistently tell me that seeing that seeing that face in the corner is incredibly helpful. Uh, it helps build and maintain that relationship with students and it makes it a little more seamless for them between in class synchronous and asynchronous kinds of content. And so that's one really nice thing that this software allows. Um, and early on, uh, we were asking folks to just type in the chat box, um, hey, you know, what are you using, right? And I, I myself have been recording, our, our campus supports um, a product called Kaltura, which lets us record the screen and record our video. Um, however, you're stuck within the Kaltura media player at that point and it can be extremely difficult to get your content out of it. And you lose the production value when you take it out, it becomes two separate videos. Uh, so what I really like about what Matt is doing is it's a single video, it lives on YouTube, and the whims of licensure and which software is gonna be supported is something that I would not have to worry about, um, assuming that YouTube has a longer lifespan than the software du jour of my university. Um, <laughs> so those were, uh, in response to a couple of folks questions, um, and, uh, and just thoughts of, of other reasons that I like this product. Yeah, the editing is amazing. I, I don't know. I, I was sort of blown away by the editing that Matt showed us because that was really, that's been really frustrating for the zoom stuff. It records it so nicely and it just goes to the cloud and you can just send the link. But if disaster ensues, that video is really hard to manipulate, i.e. I just, when disaster ensued, I just didn't share it. And I like provided notes for my students, um, which was then of course more work. I think one of the things that's been surprising to me is I knew it was gonna be more work, but I already felt like we worked a lot. And so I'm just like shocked at how, like how much more, um, sorry, there's like animals entering, how much more um, like, effort it was just to create a lecture. And I was, I, I just didn't realize that it could take even longer. So I don't know, for me, it was also just changing my expectations for myself. Yeah, that was definitely a motivation for OBS and which is the recorder and then open shot video editor, which is the editor is like, what is the minimum like techno brain smashing that I, cause it's already hard to make a lecture period. And then you have to like add on this layer of recording yourself and doing an okay job. And so I, those, I settled on those largely because I felt like they were the least amount of time for the highest unit quality. And obviously they're free and I, I really believe in open access development. So they're all, the code, source code's all on GitHub. You can, if you're really into video editing, you could be a contributor. Um, you can support them obviously monetarily too if you use them. So I really like this ethic um, generally. Uh, and it just is cool that there's actually, you know, video editing software that follows that ethic as well. So I want to, um, you know, before this started, uh, the, the panelists, we were talking about office hours and folks have sort of mentioned it in a few different ways. Um, you know, any of the attendees out there, do you want to, um, would you be willing to uh, have Julia sort of enable your sharing and talk to us about how office hours are going and you know, how these different video sharing technologies or appointments or scheduling may or may not be working because that's something that I've really, I personally feel really disconnected on how my office hours have gone. I would love to hear from somebody else out there. And as any good professor, I can just wait with this awkward silence. John Gerke, a blast from my own past is willing to share. Um, Julia, can you help John on mute? Hey, Adam. Hey, Dr. G, nice to see you. Nice, nice seeing you too. Um, and so you recall that I'm an academic advisor for undergraduate majors as well as, you know, I, had, I have grad students and a class. And um, my office hours, I would say, aren't 
attended very well unless I've been reaching out to particular students and telling them that I need to see them at that time. And so at, as we approach the end of the semester, I, there were several students in our department that I you know, could identify that probably needed to talk to an advisor about whether to drop a class or, or how to understand the new grade options for this crisis. And then there were grad students in our department that I could imagine weren't very proactive in, in, in reaching out to their peers. So not necessary, not only my students, but the students in the department, I would just have them connect up. And it worked pretty well. I, I really liked the undergrad advising with the Zoom meetings because I you know, pretty much have to look up their records and their degree audit and, and look at web pages at the university about class offerings next fall and we ran reports to see who wasn't registered for next fall the continuing students and and that provided a list of people that i knew i had to reach out to and and, mm -hmm. and re-engage nice and so you're uh well you're doing a couple things there right you're you're providing somewhat of a social safety net department-wide um but i like that you know that you went the mile to reach out to people and sort of tap those students and say, hey, you know, I haven't heard from you for a while. Uh, could we catch up? I think that's really a nice, a nice thing. I actually have not admittedly done that and I'm not sure that I know anyone else who has been going that mile, but I think it's, it, oh. it probably helps lower, I imagine it's helping lower that bar for students and make them feel like that you, you're not there begrudgingly talking to them, but you're actually reaching out to proactively engage. That's awesome. Well, so there were some students I, you know, that sort of before the crisis hit in my class, some students that weren't really performing and I should have reached out to them beforehand, but I used the crisis as an, an opportunity to reach out and I've learned, um, and you'll find this surprising, Adam Ward, that I have learned to be much more patient and less um, <laughs> judgmental during this crisis. And one of the students coined this term or shared this term that I hadn't heard before called ostriching. So she had, she was just sort of ignoring the fact that she wasn't turning anything in. And, um, and so this gave me an opportunity to tell her I wasn't going to get on her case and we we're going to discuss some options and, um, you know, and then I could check on her to see how she's doing at the other um, in her other classes. So just others that don't know me, I'm, I'm a department chair. So I feel a little bit, responsibility for the, the larger group than I would normally, so. That's great. And I'll just say, since we're recording, that I thought you've always been infinitely patient, especially with troublemakers <laughs> in the class. You've heard me growl before, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Becca, I see you, you typed in the chat um, about how you organize your office hours. Do you want to tell us a little more about it? So right now we're doing pre-registration for next fall, which is, I mean, not that much about classes as you can imagine. Um, and so uh, as, I, I mean, I have no idea. So I'm an academic advisor as well, um, uh, as well as like an advisor to my thesis students or what have you. And so I have about 30 something advisees. So I send them an all, all an email, they can sign up for, I have half hour slots for advising. Um, and so they can sign up for a slot. They, the Zoom link is always the same, but then I use the waiting room so that they, I can like sort of, sort of protect uh, privacy, or that's my hope that I'm protecting privacy. But uh, I agree with what John said. It's actually from an advising perspective, it's really nice because I can show them what in our case banner shows me is on their transcript. And like, you don't have your language requirement done or you don't have this done. And in some ways that's actually even easier than when they're in my office and I have to like, you know, swing the screen around or what have you. Um, for my classes, I typically use this Google Doc when we're face to face. Um, and a lot of this is actually to limit the students who would sit in my office hours the entire time, to be honest, um, and uh, to make sure that they come with questions. And then during classes, I have both sign up office hours for people who want to ask specific questions. And then I have open office hours where uh, similar to what Anne was talking about earlier, I'm like going over things that I think 
are challenging. Um, and so they'll tune in and they'll like see me talking about something and I record the open office hours and I don't record um, sign up office hours for classes. Nice. And uh, Sarah O'Keefe, I saw your hand raised and I think Julia is getting you enabled to share right now. Hi. Um, so I'm a, a junior. Uh, so I'm on the other end of the maybe the spectrum from your mentor. Um, uh, and uh, I renamed my office hours coffee break and advertised that it was to only talk only socialize. And people started sh showing up. But as we were socializing, they would highlight things that they were having problems with. And then I would follow up with them with an email, of, you know, would you like to ha to chat about that and then set aside another block of time to to chat about it. And so it was kind of like a, uh, a low, low stress way that they could uh, approach me. And um, it seemed to work. Nice. So that's, and I, I hear you doing the same thing that um, John is doing, right? You, you guys are both finding ways to lower that bar for office hours. Um, I guess the, the pre COVID equivalent would be the professors who hold office hours, you know, out in the atrium or out in the common space, as opposed to up shut away in their office, right? Just making it slightly easier and less pressure to attend. Uh, awesome. Uh, let's see, anyone else out there want to share what you're doing for office hours or how, how things are going? And in the, Can I just in say one thing that's been sort of helpful, um, both in face-to-face -face and digital? I think I often share the common things that come up in office hours or questions I get over email um, because I think that most of our students just there's still this fear that they're the only one with a question, right? And so I frame my uh, review every day. I frame all of that based on um, what I've heard from students the night before. And generally I've always heard from at least someone and I sometimes fib a little and say it's from a lot of people, but you know, I know that most of them don't know how to do something. And so I think that it often is a really good way to like, uh, show them how it can be helpful to not only them, but their classmates. So I try to just be reflective on that in the, I was about to say in the morning, but I have no idea when these things happen anymore. But yeah. yeah, so you're, so Becca, what I hear is you're, you're amplifying those students, right? That when, when you get that one or two students who bring you something, you're then turning around and broadcasting to the whole class, whether it's by email or in a video or what have you, you're saying, hey, I'm hearing from several people. So that's kind of like what you might do informally at the start of the next lecture uh, when the face-to-face -face synchronous teaching. Um, nice. In um, one, so I, I can't recall which of our panelists prior to the, the meeting, we were talking about office hours. Um, and I know that uh, Amy Bergen has a particular system that she uses to help make students know that her time is there for them. Um, was it Matt or Becca? Yeah, or, I, I was just saying I sort of have adapted her framing, which is largely like you give them the opportunity to schedule with you by letting them know your schedule. And so I just had these office hours that basically was like sign up for 10 minutes. You could sign up for as many as two 10 minute meetings in a row, mostly because my lab class normally all of April were outside doing stuff, but it turned into a code class. So they had a lot of like the map's not generating. Ah. And so it just takes like a minute to fix um, and walk through the, the problem. And so I just like let them have lots of frequent meetings um, certain times of the day that worked with my wife and I's um, childcare schedule, just basically like, okay, I don't have Soren right now. I can um, answer a bunch of students' questions. And I did what Becca said for sure. If, if even one, I did exactly like fib. If one student said a question and I was like, oh, that's probably other people don't know that I would be like, everyone's asking me about blah, 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 even though it might not. Um, yeah, and we use something like you can book, I think that's actually what Amy uses. I use something called a pointlet, same exact idea, and it actually generates a mini conference link for like Google Meet. So just like one of those things like we've been talking about, it was just very efficient. And so during these times where I mostly, you know, my work hours are cut in half with childcare, um, 
being efficient has been very important and that worked out pretty well. And I felt like my students in general were supported. I still, um, I think I could have learned from John and Sarah's and Becca's approach to humanize the office hours a little more. I, I had a big drop off in sort of that human to human connection. Um, and then Anne was asking a, another question in the, to the panelists, which is like about equity across sort of like internet access. And I did have three students that either had very poor internet or some that had internet go out for several weeks. And then that just made it. So with those students, interestingly, because it, that was like a humanizing event, we all exchanged phone numbers and I was able to call them and sort of like um, keep them on track. Um, and th those happen to be students that were really good and that really focused in the class even after the transition online. And so they stayed really motivated, but they were probably the ones I stayed the most connected to because of that event that made it a lot more like directly like I have to just call you because there's no other way to communicate with you. Yeah, and I think that's great. We definitely experienced some of that too, but actually um, I was thinking about with all of us relying on, um, or many of us relying on videos, whether they're live or they're pre-recorded, the issues of accessibility in terms of, are you providing transcripts? Um, have you found, I've been sort of relying on the YouTube auto-generated transcripts, but they can be pretty terrible. Um, my husband has been writing a script out and posting it, but then nobody watches the videos and it's taking a huge amount of time, but that's certainly a better way to do it and solves um, issues for both uh, students who need accommodations and um, and might have slow internet where they can, you know, open a web page, but they can't necessarily stream a video. Um, and I was curious whether anybody else had come up with a middle of the road solution between doing nothing and writing out a full transcript by hand. I think I was, my middle of the road was the YouTube transcripting, which is like you said, has a lot of problems. Um, but yeah, I guess there's certain, you could, maybe you could script like the, cause obviously we like start the call and we're sort of like mumble along and talk about things that are in the syllabus or whatever. But maybe like if you don't have enough time, you could transcript like the critical 10 minute part um, versus transcripting the whole thing. But I haven't been great about that and just sort of a, did the YouTube version. Nice. Um, so I wanted to, a couple of things. One, um, if there are any other contributions to this sort of video chatting, what are we doing? How are we engaging? Um, feel free to type those in the, into the chat box or raise your, use the raise hand tool if you want to share them. Um, I wanted to also note um, several of you will have participated in uh, a survey that Skylar Herzog, one of our other panelists and I, and I sent out um, over the last month or so. Um, so we found uh, in his results, less than 25% of faculty have used recorded video content in their classroom. Um, so if, and this was prior to the pandemic. Um, so yeah, prior to, <laughs> I, saw your, I saw your outrage, Becca. Yes. Uh, so, you know, what we're hoping here is that we can share ideas, tips and tricks, um, because we're rapidly gaining what more than 75% market share of faculty members trying to record things. Uh, and if you just look at the very early chat we had, there's I saw Camtasia's, Kaltura, Skype, PowerPoint. I mean, there's so many options that are out there. Um, so we would certainly, if, if there's anything else on this that you guys would like to share, we'd love to hear it. Um, the, other plug that I will use just to fill, uh, oops, and I don't need to fill because we've got a, a volunteer. So Yin Fan um, would like to talk about how the how breakout rooms and shared sheets are being used. Um, yeah, welcome to the chat. Go ahead, we'd love to hear. And perhaps you're muted or having a microphone issue. We don't seem to hear you right now, Yin Fan. Okay, so Yin Fan, we're, we're still not hearing from you, so I'm going to continue uh, and you just go ahead and interrupt me if, uh, if your mic starts to work. Um, so the, the other note, um, 
Oh, it's no problem. We'll, we'll be back right here next Friday at this exact same time uh, to talk about online, well, this whole transition to online in general. Um, Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Yes, welcome. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, so yeah, I want to talk about how my lab was going. Um, it, uh, so it's a 20 people lab, it's a writing intensive and with a lot of hands-on and field trip. And it was so difficult at the beginning that how we transitioned to uh, online format and all the field trips were canceled and all the students were so disappointed. And um, so other than adjusting to all coding way and um, that's also not a challenging so what we found with the TA's help that we break them into groups um, and then we have them um, like working as a group with a shared um, Google Sheet, uh, one of the topics called valuing tree. So we have a pre-populated template in the Google Sheet and then they in their own breakout room, they can um, using the breakout room as a discussion um, portion with their group and then have a shared Google Sheet um, so they can all work on, on the same sheet. And as TA or me instructor, we can jump around the, the breakout room to see how they are doing. And at the same time, because we, they all share the same Google Sheet, we can jump around the different tab of the Google Sheet to see how they have been working on all the question or calculation. And that end up to be working so much better. Um, students are happier, they have this peer and uh, classmate to work together and at the same time everybody can see on the screen what's going on um, so that has been working out really well and uh, one another example is um, other than google sheet we have them all work on the google slide as group and then at the end of the lab they all present together to the entire lab classes so everybody take turn presenting about coral uh, the threat to the coral, the coral ecology, and what's the coral restoration. And then they all did really, really well with the Google slide function. And um, so everybody worked, for, uh, each group worked on like two or three slides. So that was really working out for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's really great. I think um, we're, you know, we're nearing the end of our hour. It's causing me to think that um, Maybe we'll want to, you know, today we spend a lot of time on video conferencing. Um, this idea of sort of breakout groups and how do we have meaningful student to student interactions in an online teaching environment is, uh, I, I think I'd like to say yes and, um, and see if we can maybe get someone to talk to us about that or maybe even tap you to give a short presentation on what has been working in one of our future weeks. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so being being respectful of folks time because we planned on on an hour um there's just two plugs i would like to make before we sign off for the day um and so next week um we'll have imad habib on the phone with us um and imad is the pi for a project uh called hydro learn um and you might have seen us pitch this he talked to us briefly about a month ago um, so he'll spend about 15 minutes to show you what it takes to get started on HydroLearn, um, both as someone who just wants to take modules that already exist and use them in your class. Um, for example, there are some modules on there that are like getting started with HEC HMS, um, that between written content, assignments, and video content, there's someone who's already thought about how to asynchronously teach someone how to get started in that kind of a program. And so next week um, in this seminar, we'll start with Imad talking about HydroLearn and fielding questions there. And then the discussion will um, meander to where it goes, depending on our panelists and our attendees, as we did today. Um, and the second pitch that I will make, um, so many of you will be familiar with uh, Quasi's HydroShare system, um, where you may think of that as a place to share data. Um, to meet those data management plan promises that you made to the NSF. Um, our, our sort of group here, uh, one of the other things that we're doing is adding educational resources to HydroShare. Um, so I've put a link in the chat box um, that takes you right to that repository on HydroShare. Um, and what you can see is 
in the last week or so, um, I've added the complete content for four of my classes online. Uh, and so that's my slides, my notes that I use to teach from. Um, and there's also a quick start guide on there. And within about 15 minutes, uh, you could take that homework assignment that you're proud of, that video that you made that you explain green amped infiltration better than anyone's ever done in the history of hydrology. Um, you could f feel free to share your content there as well. Um, it's as easy as making an account and dragging and dropping. Um, but what we're hoping to do is kind of build a database of, um, in line with HydroLearn, um, also build a database of teaching materials. So faculty who are new, faculty who don't have 15 other hydrologists, but might be the hydrologist in their department or at their institution, um, have access to additional high quality resources. And so if you're you know, finding yourself bored this afternoon and thinking, geez, how can I benefit hydrology educators and students around the world uh, in the next 15 minutes, uh, you might think about a HydroShare account and sharing with us, you know, could be a project assignment, could be one lecture you love. It doesn't have to be a whole class, but I thought I should lead by example. Um, and Ida is pointing out that um, there's lots of good water resources content on CERC as well. Absolutely true. Um, all right, so with that, I'll, I'll open it up one last time. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Any other topics you wanna suggest for a future conversation? Um, and anything else from fellow panelists? Okay, well, thanks again, uh, Matt, for agreeing to present this week. Um, we'll get this, um, this video recorded and archived. Uh, we'll post it on YouTube, apparently not as seamlessly since we're doing it through Zoom uh, as the technology you just taught us about this morning, <laughs> but we will get there. Um, and thanks to my fellow panelists, everybody else, and we'll see you back here in a week um, to talk about some of the techniques and also just to share what we're all doing to try to make it through this uh, awkward transition. Thanks, everybody. Much appreciated. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Good luck with the rest of the semester.